Okay. We can see it. Yeah. So, so what I want to do in my talk is, uh, well, explain what semi-mimic semantics is, raise some uh, issues that are typical finite model theory issues. So why finite model theories should be interested in semi-ring semantics. And then I will focus on one particular topic that is the topic of zero one laws. Uh, so um, what is semi-ring semantics? Now it's based on the idea to evaluate logical statements, uh, not just by true and false, but by values in a commutative semi-rings semi-ring and uh, the zero element of the semi-ring interprets uh, false assertions and all other elements provide some shade of truth. The idea is we have two, the two operations, addition and multiplication in the semi-ring where addition interprets the alternative use of information as it appears in disjunction and extension quantifiers, whereas multiplication interprets the joint use of information as in conjunctions and universal quantifiers. Now, so one element of the semi-ring represents untracked information, that is information we take for granted and uh, do not put into question. But the classical semantics, of course, reappears in the special case when we use the Boolean semi-ring. But there are many other interesting semi-rings, and these give us more detailed information about the statements, such as confidence course, cost analysis, uh, we count number of evaluation strategies, we can reason about a different access level to information, and so on. So I guess you know what a commutative semi-ring is, so let me just give some examples. Uh, so uh, a very important semi-ring is semi-ring of natural numbers, which is important, for instance, in back semantics and databases, and it is here uh, mostly used for counting uh, evaluation strategies and proofs. Uh, a different semi-ring is a tropical semi-ring over the uh, positive, non-negative real numbers together with infinity, where addition is minimization and multiplication is addition. And this is mainly used for, for cost interpretations. Uh, uh, closely related semi-ring is the Viterbi semi-ring over the real interval zero one with max and uh, usual multiplication as the operation. This semi-ring is in fact isomorphic to the tropical semi-ring but uh, it's mostly used to reason about confidences. And then there is a vast class of uh, min-max semi-rings. Uh, here is a particular example, the so-called security semi-ring, uh, where you have different access levels for information, like, like public, confidential, secret, top secret, and you want to reason about the so required clearance level for, uh, for evaluating a logical statement. And then there are all lattice semi-ring induced by a partial order. So beyond these semi-rings, there are many more uh, that one usually calls application semi-rings. They are so-called provenance semi-rings of polynomials or in some case of formal power series, where the idea is that we want to track literals. So we want to answer questions such as which combination of the literals are responsible for the truth of a statement and possibly how often is a literal used in an evaluation. And we do this as follows. We take a set of indeterminates, or sometimes called provenance tokens, which are used to label those literals that we want to track. So each literal is mapped to one of these indeterminates, whereas the untracked literals are just mapped to their truth values zero or one. And then this evaluates a first order sentence to a polynomial it's a semi-ring NX of multivariate polynomials in these indeterminates with coefficients from the natural numbers. And this, in fact, is a commutative semi-ring that is freely generated by this set of indeterminates. Uh, besides this semi-rings, there are also other interesting polynomial semi-rings. For instance, we can drop coefficients, such as x01 as coefficients or drop exponent and so on. So these semi-rings that give somewhat less information but admit simple computation. So it's a trade-off in the choice of the semi-ring used. So uh, let's look at this more precisely. So consider a map uh, mapping the literals over some fixed universe fixed vocabulary to indeterminates or zero and one and its evaluation of a sentence to a polynomial. Of course, we can write this polynomial as a sum of monomials in these indeterminates. And what does it tell us? Now, each such monomial will tell us that there exists precisely C, this coefficient, many 
evaluation strategies of that sentence on the given universe, which for each of these uh, variables xi, uh, so which use the literals labeled by these variables precisely e to the i time. So it tells us each, each monomial tells us something about strategies, namely what literals the strategy uses, the evaluation strategy or the proof, if you want, and how often. And um, this has a number of applications. For instance, here is a brief application to cost analysis. So suppose we have a cost function that, that maps the indeterminates to the cost of accessing the, the relevant the, the associated literal. So the cost of accessing the fact that beta is true in alpha is determined by the value of the indeterminate x beta. So since this is uh, so, so free semi-ring over x, it has universal property. So this map H extends uniquely to a homomorphism of the polynomial semi-ring into the tropical semi-ring. And this homomorphism maps the polynomial to the minimal cost of an evaluation strategy showing that the sentence is true in A. And this also works for other semi-rings. So an idea is to always evaluate um, uh, a sentence in a, in a very general semi-ring, such as this one, and then spe specialize it by homomorphism to specific application semi-rings. So let's look a bit more precisely what such semi-ring interpretations are. So we fix a co some commutative semi-ring which we assume to be naturally ordered. This means that the order relation defined by addition is indeed a partial order. So it's, it's anti-symmetric. So this excludes rings. We're not interested in rings. We're interested in naturally ordered uh, semi-rings. So a, a K interpretation is then just a function that maps each literal of a fixed vocabulary and a fixed finite universe not just to a truth value, but to a value in this commutative semi-ring. Uh, then we extend this by mapping equalities and inequalities just to the truth values. So we have these available as well. Notice that in general, not all such maps make sense. So we are specifically interested in such interpretation that we call model defining, which means that the map is compatible with, with negation. That if when you have an atom and its negation, precisely one of these should be mapped to zero, that is to false, and the other one should be mapped to some non-zero value, some shade of truth. In there, that case, the semi-ring interpretation specifies a unique structure, but in the other direction, it's not unique, right? So a structure may be defined by a number of different um, semi-ring interpretations. It should be noted that there are also other interesting type of interpretations that are not necessarily model defining, but many issues are studied, especially for the model defining interpretations. Now, a K interpretation mapping literals to semi-ring values naturally extends to evaluation of arbitrary first order sentences. Uh, uh, so it gives values to any first order sentence, but just interpreting disjunction and existential quantifiers by addition. Recall that we are in finite model theory, so this universe is finite, so this has a finite sum, so no problem with, uh, uh, with correct definitions. And um, conjunctions and universal quantifiers are evaluated via multiplication. Now, an issue is negation. We just uh, assume that formulae are given in negation normal form. So if we had I have a sentence that is not a negation normal form, we translate it into negation normal form to, uh, to make sense of this evaluation, right? And this is indeed an interesting issue. Negation is not uh, a semi-ring operation and it's problematic for semi-rings. So by dealing it via negation normal form, this just means we define it away, really, right? And uh, in semi-rings of polynomials, this means that we have actually dual indeterminates, right? We have an indeterminate for an atom, and we have an indeterminate for its negation. 
and so it comes with constraints, right? So constraint is that the product of these two is zero. And algebraically, this means that we do not really work in directly in this polynomial semi-ring, but it's in its quotient with respect to this congruence. It should be noted there are other um, proposals to deal with negations to consider, for instance, special uh, semi-rings with a truncated subtraction operation, but this is the most convenient for us. So what I want to argue is that this kind of semi-ring semantics poses interesting issues for finite model series. So it, it leads to connections between a special kind of multi-valued logics and uh, finite model theory. And one issue is, uh, well, to study the traditional logical facts in this new light. For instance, in Boolean semantics, it is of course the case that elementary equivalence and isomorphism are the same because every finite structure can be defined up to isomorphism in first order logic. Right? But this fails in certain semi-rings. Well, in some semi-rings it does not fail, in other semi-rings it fails, for instance, in min-max semi-rings with at least three elements. And indeed, finite semi-ring interpretations, as opposed to finite structures, are not always first order definable up to isomorphism. And even if they are, they may need an infinite axiom system. And even if a finite axiom system suffices, a single axiom might not. So there are uh, issues that are very simple in, in the traditional semantics, raise interesting research problems uh, in semi-ring semantics. Another issue that we currently are working on is the question of locality, right? So in classical semantics, first order logic is local, right? So several notions to make precise half locality, uh, Geifman locality, and especially there is a so-called Geifman normal form that every sentence in first order logic is equivalent to a Boolean combination of local sentences. A question, do these things stand up in semi-ring semantics? It turns out that Hanf locality more or less survives, but uh, in most semi-rings, there is no Geifman normal form since semi-ring semantics really cry, uh, requires that one really goes through the entire structure when evaluating a quantifier. So in general, this does not hold that we have a Geifman normal form, but in specific cases, uh, when both operations are either potent, uh, we may still have it. Another typical finite model theory question is, uh, well, in finite model theory, we're not focused so much on first order logic as in other fields. So can we define appropriate semi-ring semantics also for stronger logic? Uh, for instance, for full, in particular for full least fixed point logic. And the answer is yes, we can, but we have to impose additional uh, algebraic conditions on the underlying semi-rings. Right? So we need semi-rings where these fixed point operations are well defined and have good properties. And algebraic, this means that we need semi-rings that are fully continuous. We'll tell you something about infinite chains. And I won't go into details here. And we need semi-rings that are absorptive. So to satisfy this absorption law, so uh, product AB is absorbed by A. And this has the effect of making multiplication decreasing with respect to the natural order, as it should be. Right? The conjunction should be less true than its, than its conjunct. Um, so with such semi-rings, this works. And the universal uh, semi-rings satisfying this are also rather interesting. So the, the semi-ring NX of multivariate polynomials is no longer fully continuous and absorptive, but there is a very interesting semi-ring of what we call generalized absorptive polynomials, which are polynomials of this form here. So we have no coefficients, but we admit infinity as an exponent. First, we have absorption. So those polynomials that have larger exponents are just deleted by those that have smaller exponents. And we have shown that these semi-rings really have algebraic properties that make them the right general semi-rings for fixed point logics. And this also leads to interesting applications, uh, for instance, to strategy analysis for infinite games. So the general approach is the following, to evaluate a least fixed point formula that, that expresses that a specific position X is a winning position in such a game. Now, these formula are typically not expressive in first order logic, but require fixed points. So we take this fixed point formula and evaluate 
in some interpretation into the semi ring of generalized absorptive uh, polynomials. And we can show that the evaluation provide, provides very detailed information about all the available winning strategies uh, from that position. So it gives us precise overview of the possible winning strategies that you have. Now, a detailed case study for this for BC game has appeared last year at the Gandalf conference. So let me now come to the issue that I mainly want to, to present here, right? I think also Guillermo Badia is especially interested uh, in this. We had a correspondence on this uh, previously this year. So this is about uh, zero one laws and almost sure valuations in uh, semi-ring semantics. Right? And um, so let me remind you first of the classical zero one law for first order logic in Boolean semantics. So the idea is following, fix a constant between zero and one and considers a GNP model of random graphs uh, defined by Erdős and Reni a long time ago, where we take the universe consisting of the first and natural number and then independently for each pair of nodes i and j, we decide randomly whether the edge from i to j exists with probability p or not with probability one minus p. So this is, defines a probability space of random graphs. And uh, for each n and p, we have the probability that a random graph satisfies a given sentence p. Right? And the zero one law for first order logic uh, proved by four Russians in 69 and by failing in 76 independently is that every sentence uh, in first order logic uh, the sequence of probability converges exponentially fast to either zero or one. So uh, informally, we say that the first order sentence is either almost surely false or it's almost surely true. And this holds not just for graph, but it holds generally for relational structures and it holds for interesting classes of relational structures. I think Javier Caicedo will talk a bit more on this. So what is the proof? Because the proof goes via, at least Fagin's proof, goes via extension axioms. So an extension axiom is just a statement saying that every configuration of k elements can be extended in every consistent way to k plus one elements. So for graph, this means that whenever we have a collection of k nodes and some i smaller than k, then there is a node with edges to the first i nodes, but not to the last k minus i nodes. Right? And the proof of the zero one law starts with proving that each of these extension axioms is almost surely true, which is not difficult to show because if the large graph grows larger and larger, then the probability that such a node W exists uh, goes to one exponentially fast. So every extension axiom is almost surely true. And the next step is to show that the theory of all these extension axioms is an infinite axiom system is omega categorical, that is, it has a unique countable model. This uses a back and forth argument. So it follows that the theory is complete. And by compactness, we can conclude that for every first order statement, either the statement itself or its negation uh, is entailed by a finite collection of um, extension axioms. And since all of these are, are almost surely true, either psi or not psi is almost surely true, so the zero one law follows. Now, random structures naturally generalize to random semi-ring interpretations. So how do we define random semi-ring interpretations? Such each, for each atom uh, of some fixed vocabulary and some fixed finite universe uh, of an initial subset of natural numbers, we first decide by coin flip whether the atom or its negation is true. We assign the, the value zero to the false literal and randomly assign to the true literal a value according to some fixed probability distribution on the non-zero values of the semi. Okay? So we get probabilities. So on such a probability space, a probability that the valuation of a sentence C is the value J of the semi. -ring. And from the classical zero one law, we can conclude that 
Well, either almost surely it, it evaluates to zero, or almost surely it evaluates to something that is not zero. Right? But of course, this is, uh, well, not very informative. So we aim at uh, more informative results. And these are the questions that we study. Right? We can say the classical zero one laws partitions first order logic into the almost false sentences, almost truly false sentences, and the almost truly true sentences. So do we get similar partitions, but now for all severing values? So do we have a partition of first order logic uh, into uh, classes phi j, so that all sentences in phi j evaluate to j almost surely? If this is the case, are all these classes non-empty or do the almost true valuations concentrate on just a few values? On which semi-rings does this work? Does it work for all semi-ring? And how does the partition depend on the underlying semi-ring? And finally, what is the complexity of computing the almost true valuation? And for simplicity, we discuss mostly here finite min-max semi-rings with the simplest case, but the result extend to other semi-rings as well. It's just the simplest case to talk about. Now, the first is, is there something like an extension axiom? Right? So we have extension properties. So they're not formulated as axioms, but we can still state extension properties. So say that if a configuration of K points is realized, then all consistent extensions to K plus one points are also realized in the given interpretation, right? So what are configurations? These are just assignments of semi-ring values to the literals, well, in a consistent way that is respecting negation, right? For negation, one of the two, uh, so for atom, and so it's negation, one of the two has been mapped to zero. And so the first step, showing that extension axioms are almost surely true. This translates with almost the same proof to this setting here. So for finite semi-rings, random K interpretations almost surely have the K extension property for every fixed K. And the proof is simple, uses the same arguments as in the Boolean case. And there is a famous statement by Bolobos, or I should say infamous statement, saying that the first order zero one looks sophisticated, but follows from shallow computation. Right? This is true and false, right? I mean, it is true as far as the probabilistic computations are concerned. So to calculate that extension axioms are almost surely true is a, a trivial probability exercise. But I mean, to prove the zero one loss, there come logical statements into play such as compactness and back and forth argument, which I don't think you can convincingly argue that they are shallow. But uh, what the probabilistic computations are concerned, this is right, and this is also the case in the semi-ring setting. So the rest, we need to go a different road. And what we use here are algebraic descriptions. Now, we have already seen that first, the evaluation of first order statement can be done by polynomials. That we can associate with a first order statement a polynomial where the indeterminates basically are the literals. Right? So this statement here would translate over uh, to such a polynomial. So the universal quantifier translates into a, a product. Uh, this would be a, a multiplication. Um, uh, and the existential quantifier translates into a sum. Now, but there is a problem with this translation of uh, logical statement into uh, into polynomials, that is that the polynomial depends on the universe, right? Here you have a large sum and the sum depends on the size of the universe. And what we have to do is to, to do better in the sense that we need to associate with a statement as a first order statement, let's say with K variable, a fixed polynomial that does not depend on the universe. So it only depends on the number of variables. And this indeed can be done if we have the K extension property. But it's, it's okay to use the K, K extension property because it holds almost surely. So we use indeterminates that are associated with the literal that use at most K variables. So we have a bounded set of literals once we fixed K. Okay? 
And the coefficients are also not taken from the natural number, but they are taken from a very small semi-ring with just three elements. Two does not suffice, we need a third element, E. Right? So this is an idempotent semi-ring or min-max semi-ring, if you want. And the translation is, well, as before, right? We, uh, we uh, associate disjunction with addition, a conjunction with multiplication. But for quantifier, and in fact, it's here for technical reasons, uh, better to use not the traditional quantifier, but the exclusion, including quantifier. Uh, so there exists a y different from the other three variables such that this holds. And then this is translated into a sum over the consistent assignment of these variables to a zero and one or to zero and e. So let's make, make this uh, a bit more precise. So it is essentially, it corresponds to a quantifier elimination argument. So suppose we have a statement of this form. A statement says there exists a y such that phi. We assume that we already have associated with phi a polynomial. Right? Now the indeterminates are associated with the literal. So we especially look at those literals that involve the variable y. So we have those that do not involve y and those that do involve y. And now, we assume the extension property. Now, if this formula is even satisfiable, then by the extension property, we, there is also a witness P that realizes a maximal extension, right? So the true literals involving B do not just get an arbitrary truth value, but they get the maximal truth value, which is one in this semi-ring. And then we associate it with C, well, the new polynomial taking the sum where these variables y are, repl are replaced by all consist consistent assignment of the y variables to zero and one, consistent meaning again that out of any pair of complementary literal, one is y to zero and the other to one. Now, this is a large sum, but it is a bounded sum. Right? So this is again a fixed uh, polynomial, which el eliminates all the variables that are associated with the quantified variable here. So here is an example, right? Here is a simple existential statement. So we associate it with the atom specific variables. So here x, y, and x bar and y bar for the negation, which translates this formula here into this polynomial. Right, we have negation of this times this variable here, which associated with y, and and so on. Right, and now the existential quantifier here. So this means the y variables are replaced by the consistent assignment of zero and one to y. Now consistent means that this gets zero and this gets one, or vice versa. So we get this expression here which simplifies to x plus x bar. And then we do the same for x, which means we have the sum over the consistent assignments of zero and one to x and x bar, which is zero plus one plus one plus zero with one, right? So this sentence is associated with the polynomial one, and this is to be interpreted that the sentence evaluates almost surely to the maximal truth value in the system. How do we do it for universal quantifiers? So for existential quantifiers, we use sum and consistent assignment to zero and one. Whereas for the universal quantifier, we use product and consistent assignment to zero and this constant E. And this constant E stands for the smallest possible value uh, in the semi-ring. It is the smallest value that is different uh, from zero, right? So we get an expression like this. And again, it's best explained as an example. So we have here an ex a statement that involves a universal quantifier. So we have the same way of associating a polynomial with the part with a quantifier part here or the existential quantifiers here. And then we have this interesting universal quantifier, which means we take the product over the two consistent assignment of x to e and zero. 
So assign this to E and this to zero or vice versa, takes a product. So this gives E times E and since the semi ring is U to be idempotent, it evaluates to E. So this reflects the fact that the sentence evaluates almost surely to the minimal possible truth value in the given semi ring. But this is the general operation of how we associate with a sentence a polynomial and it has the following property. So assume a finite min max semi ring, assume a first order of formula with free variable with the associated polynomial. And if a semi ring interpretation has a K extension property, then this uh, polynomial reflects the value of phi in a uh, consist in, in, a, in a correct way. That is, whatever we plug in for the free variable and consider it atomic type, then the evaluation of the polynomial for the atomic type is the same as the evaluation of the formula here. Right? And of course, ultimately we're interested in sentence, but if it is a sentence, then we have a polynomial that has no longer any variables. So the polynomial is a constant that is either zero, one, or e. Right? And it reflects correctly the value of e. And now the zero one law follows, right? Since k interpretations almost surely have the k extension property, then every first order for sentence has a unique almost sure valuation. And moreover, there are only three possible values, either zero or one, or the minimal non-zero value of the semi ring. Right? So it is not the case that all values of the semi ring can appear as almost sure valuation, but only the maximal truth value or the minimal positive truth value or the value for false. And to, to end, let me explain this at an example or illustrate this with an example. So we look again into the security semi-ring. That's a security semi-ring which labels atomic facts as public, confidential, secret, or top secret, or false or inaccessible. Right? Now, in this semi-ring, the valuation of a sentence describes the minimal clearance level that you need to be able to verify that the statement is true. Right? And now assume that some dumb security officer assigns access restrictions just randomly, right? And uh, what does the zero one law say as then? Right? It said, if a sentence is almost surely true in the classical setting, then either the associated polynomial evaluates to one, and this means that C can almost surely be verified with public information. With, so the clearance level one is sufficient to evaluate it. This is typically the case for existential statements, right? Because then the, the probability of having a, a large witness is extremely high. But the other possibility is that the polynomial evaluates to the minimal truth value, and the verification of C requires top secret information, right? This is the smallest positive value. And typically, this is the case for a true universal statement. So a clearance level for just confidential or secret information is completely useless in that setting, right? You need, uh, you need top secret clearance for, for this. Okay, I mean, I have used too much time, but uh, so I should stop here. But just let me tell you that beyond finite min max semi-ring, this zero one law extends also to other classes of semi-rings such as finite and infinite lattices. Other absorptive semi rings, uh, such as the tropical semi rings, the Viterbi semi ring, and so on. And um, well, the most interesting semi ring that does not satisfy these properties is the natural semi ring. The natural semi ring also satisfies the zero one law, but it has to be proved by different methods. Has, rather than polynomial, we have to use what we call infinity expressions. But I think for reasons of time, I should stop here.